so before we dig in to the APA citation style itself, I like to sort of generally address what citation overall is uh, and why exactly we have to do it. Uh, I used to teach writing at the college level and that was like the most common question that I got about citation was why do we even have to do this? Uh, and the most important thing with citation is you're trying to create a record of your research, not just for yourself, but for other scholars and researchers who are going to be engaging with your research. And it's important for them to be able to source where you got your information. Uh, we commonly refer to that as the scholarly conversation. Uh, and so it's important that we not necessarily prove where we found our information, but it, have that record so that if other people are curious about where you got, you know, this 60% citation or the 60% number in your statistics, they can go look at that citation, find it for themselves and see like the methods that were used in that study and that kind of thing. Uh, so specifically in this uh, webinar, we'll be talking about the seventh edition of APA citation. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, APA 7th edition came out late last year, October 2019. Uh, so this semester, the fall semester, is the first full semester where 7th edition APA is going to be the standard moving forward. Uh, obviously, if you have any questions specifically about citation, I highly recommend reaching out to your professors to see if they uh, prefer 6th or 7th edition still. I know some professors are still looking at 6th edition. Uh, it's probably in your syllabus somewhere. Um, but the general rule of thumb with these kinds of webinars is I can tell you broadly what the rules are, but I can't specifically tell you what the person grading you is going to be saying, you know. Uh, AMA, or sorry, APA is most commonly used in the sciences. Uh, MLA, Chicago, AMA, or JAMA are three other very commonly used citation styles you might have encountered before. Uh, and if you look at all of these different citation styles, they all use the same basic elements for the most part. It's just different ways of arranging them, essentially. Um, so getting a little more into the specifics of APA itself, uh, general formatting. So you have a whole list of different citation uh, different font formats that are acceptable these days. Uh, you know, Times New Roman 12 point has always been the standard and that's still totally acceptable, but there are a few others that are allowable now. Uh, double spaced as usual. A big change from sixth edition to seventh edition is that there's no running head required for student papers, which hopefully makes your lives a lot easier. <laughs> uh, and then formatting for your reference list specifically, uh, same standard formatting as sixth edition. It should be titled references. It should be alphabetically uh, organized. There should be a hanging indent and it should be double spaced. Uh, so APA uses in-text citation or parenthetical citation as its primary form of uh, in-text citation. And the general format is, as you can see here, the author's last name, the, the item was published, uh, and then the pages, if applicable. Uh, if there are more than three authors, and this is a change from sixth edition, uh, you use just the first author's last name, and then et al, and the year, and the page number, if applicable. Uh, that just makes it a little less complicated for you because you don't have to worry about typing out every single author's name the first time around. Uh, now, something that we've been encountering a bit more recently with a lot of the COVID research going on and that sort of thing is research by the same author that has been published within the same year. And thankfully, APA has a really handy format for us to use to differentiate between different publications by the same author that were published in the same year. Uh, so as you can see, this example here is Smith 2020A, page 13, and then the other citation from that same author in the same year would be Smith 2020 B, page 74. Uh, just be sure that you add the year demarcation to the correct reference in your reference list, because the important thing, of course, is making sure that the in-text citation leads back to the correct citation in your reference list. Uh, 
<laughs> All right, so getting into the nitty gritty of citations in and of themselves, uh, the seventh edition of APA really simplified things in a lot of ways. There's still a decent amount of information you need to include. But for example, with book citations, you used to need to include the location of the publisher. And that's not a requirement anymore, thankfully. Uh, publishers are a lot more decentralized these days, so it was kind of hard to determine whether this publisher was located in New York City or, or in San Francisco or uh, out in Tokyo or you know somewhere else like that. Uh, so for book citations, you need the author's last name, first initial, the year it was published, the title of the book, uh, edition if it's not the first edition, and then the publisher. So the example I have here of Essentials of Health Policy and Law, pretty straightforward. Uh, there you have that. And then building off of book citations, if you're citing a chapter in a book, uh, you're basically doing a book citation with a little extra information. Uh, so as you can see here, we're looking at a chapter in nursing theories and nursing practice. Uh, specifically, here we have Smith and Parker, who are the authors of the chapter. Uh, the title of the chapter and the year, um, broadly speaking, if you are looking at the year that a chapter in a book was published, it's going to be the same as the year that the book itself came out. There will be a note if that is not the case. Uh, so articles are also fairly similar uh, at this point uh, as to what they were before. Uh, yeah, we're getting some background noise. If you guys wouldn't mind muting uh, if you're not me. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, so for the article citations, again, it's the similar thing where you have the author listed first, the year, the title of the article, the journal, the volume, the issue, the page range. And then the big change here is the DOI. You used to just include the DOI as the alphanumeric string by itself, but in seventh edition, they ask that you go ahead and turn that into a URL uh, just to make it a bit easier to go ahead and link to whatever citation uh, you're linking to there. Uh, now, of course, there are articles out there that do not have DOIs. They're generally older articles, uh, you know, stuff that was written before the internet was you know, used as a repository for research and journals and publishing. Uh, and if that's the case, then you can just use the URL of the journal's homepage if they have a web presence. Uh, if not, you can just skip that step altogether. Uh, websites are also fairly straightforward, uh, personal or group author. The most complicated thing here is the dates included. Uh, so for example here, the Explore Health Careers website that I have, 2020 was the last copyright date that was available on the page. Uh, and then I retrieved it on September 9th of 2020. Now I put that on there in case the information included on the website changes uh, between now and you know whenever you're looking at the website. Uh, and that's really when you need to include a retrieve date is if it's something that you think might change in the future. Uh, if you don't think it's going to change, if it's, you know, something fairly static, like a university website, uh, then you don't really need to include the retrieve date. Oh, and the site name, you only need to include the site name if the site name is different than the group author. Uh, government documents, uh, so there are more complicated formats for things like laws and statutes. And I'll point you guys to where you can find that information on our website at Himmelfarb if you need that. Uh, but for your basic government documents, things like reports, statistics, that sort of thing, you just need to use the name of the organization. Uh, so for the example I have here, it's the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, the year, the title of the report, and then of course the URL where we can find it. Uh, now, for things like the Department of Housing and Urban Development or the CDC, obviously, we most commonly use those acronyms in day-to-day -day conversation, HUD, CDC, WHO, that sort of thing. Uh, but in in-text citations, 
you do need to go ahead and use the full name of whatever organization you're referencing in the first in-text citation you do. So as you can see, the example here has the full US Department of Housing and Urban Development. And then parenthetically after that, we have HUD and then the year and the page number. Uh, after that, any subsequent in-text citations, you can go ahead and just use the acronym. You don't have to use the full thing. Uh, and of course, you can have government documents that do have individual authors, in which case, instead of putting the organization at the front as if they were the author, you go ahead and put them after the title of the report. Uh, so here, for example, we have a report from the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, but it was written by Polanker et al. here. So we cite them first, since they're explicitly given as authors, year, title of the report, name of the organization, and then again, the URL. Uh, all right, so we had a few questions about formatting citations. So I'll go ahead and answer those real quick before we move on to the next uh, section. Uh, so first one, same author, multiple articles in one year. What's the format for A, B, C in the reference list? So in the reference list, uh, let me go to the back to the article here. So let's say that we had multiple articles by this group of four authors. What you would do is you would put them in order of uh, the title within that same year. So let's say that we had one that started with uh, malaria instead of retention, that would go before this one. Uh, but it, after 2019, you put the A. Uh, and then for this retention one, you would put B after 2019. And that would then tie into the in-text citation reference there. Uh, let's see what were some of the other questions folks had. Uh, author's credentials. So do you need to add author's credentials such as MD into in-text citations? No, you do not. Uh, so as far as uh, credentials go, generally you don't need to include credentials in any way, though if you're trying to create a sense of authority in the uh, in what you're citing, you can go ahead and refer to people's credentials within the text of your paper itself, uh, but that's definitely not a requirement for the citation as a whole. Uh, for live URLs and references, uh, generally whatever it defaults to when you're using uh, like Microsoft Word, or in this case for the PowerPoint, clearly it defaulted to a hyperlinked purple text citation. Uh, so that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, again, that can vary from professor to professor. So generally, if you're worried about that, I would reach out to your individual uh, professor. But for the most part, not something you really need to worry about. Uh, if the website does not have a date, you can just put ND as opposed to a date, uh, but 99.9% .9 of uh, websites will have a date associated with them, either an update date or more commonly a copyright date that also serves as a last updated date. Um, so for instance, on this Explore Health Careers, there's no date tied to the nursing overview itself, but if you scroll down to the bottom of the page there, you'll see copyright 2020. Uh, and so that's the date you would use. But in the event that you do have a website without a date, as it says here, just put ND for no date. Uh, yeah, and so again, like if you're citing the CDC and there's no date associated with the report, uh, there should be most CDC reports that I've seen have one. Um, but if it doesn't have a date or a copyright date associated with it, again, same thing, no date. Uh, all right, so I wanted to talk a little bit as well about some of the online resources that we have available for you guys. Uh, so first off, we have a research guide that we created on Himmelfarb that has examples of just about everything you could possibly want to cite. Uh, for example, we have uh, how to cite a tweet or how to cite a Facebook post. Uh, those are different than just how to cite a general website. So if you have anything that you're trying to cite, highly recommend bookmarking this guide, going to it, uh, checking, you know, how do I cite this tweet? It'll be right there with an example and instructions. 
Uh, these other three resources, while they're not something that we have produced for you guys, they are produced by some really great organizations. Um, so obviously the APA style blog and the APA style and grammar guidelines come directly from the APA themselves. Uh, the style blog is especially helpful as time goes on and people have questions about, well, how do I cite, you know, this new form of social media that pops up? The APA style blog will respond to that and will put out a blog post where they say, okay, if you need to cite a TikTok video, this is how you would format that. Uh, so it's a very great resource to have as we sort of move through seventh edition. Uh, the Style and Grammar Guidelines has all of the basic APA citation information, as well as things like uh, preferred terminology and capitalization and, you know, just about any sort of style or grammar thing you might have a question about. Uh, and then last but not least, the Purdue Online Writing Lab, most commonly called the Purdue OWL, is a phenomenal resource, not just for APA, but for just about every citation style you could imagine. Uh, they have extensive uh, information on how to cite things. They have a bunch of examples, handouts, tons of different stuff. So highly recommend them as a great online resource. Uh, another thing I wanna talk about are citation generators. Uh, I know that I have used citation gener generators in the past. There's really nothing wrong with generators in and of themselves. The problem is that quite often they are inaccurate. Uh, for example, I used one once when I was putting together a different version of a citation webinar, and I looked at a book that I had used for my thesis, and I decided to use that as an example for a citation. And I pulled it up in the citation generator, and it said that there wasn't a publication date for it, which obviously doesn't make any sense. I have the physical book. Uh, so you want to make sure that if you are going to use citation generators, you double, triple, quadruple check them to make sure that they are formatted correctly, that they have the correct information. Uh, I also wanted to highlight that we actually have a built-in citation generator in our catalog. Uh, so this is actually a screenshot from the Himmelfarb catalog. I looked up the new public health, and if you go into the entry for any article or any book that's in our catalog, under this send to where you've got this pink circle on citation, just click there and it will generate a citation for you based off of the information within our catalog. Uh, and that information is going to be a lot more reliable than anything that a free web generator is pulling from the internet. Uh, obviously, as it cautions down here, check citations for accuracy before including them because there could still be something wrong. Um, but if you're going to use a generator, this is a lot more reliable than anything that you're gonna find out there for free. Another great resource that a lot of students aren't familiar with is the GW Writing Center. Um, now, during non-pandemic times, uh, they offer both distance and in-person meetings. They even have a satellite location within the Himmelfarb Library where they have somebody who is a public health expert come a couple days a week and provide consultations. However, given that everything is online, or almost everything is online this semester, they're working entirely online. Uh, you can still make appointments with trained consultants. I believe they use the Zoom teleconferencing software, um, but you can make an individual appointment with them for half an hour or an hour to go over anything you want related to writing. It's not just citation. Uh, they also work with you on style and structure and sentence flow, just any possible thing you could need help with in your writing. Uh, the other thing that I want to tell you guys about, which is a really phenomenal resource we have here at GW, is RefWorks. Uh, it's a citation manager software. You get a free account through GW and it's permanent. So even once you graduate and leave GW, you're still able to access this RefWorks account and use it and add to it. Uh, it's also library supported, which is really handy if you ever run into any issues with it. You can always reach out to myself or one of the other reference librarians and we'll be able to help you figure out what might be going wrong. Uh, it has integration with both Microsoft Word and Google Documents, depending on which version you're using. There's a classic version and a ProQuest version. Uh, both of them are 
phenomenal. They both offer a lot of the same uh, same features. It's just that there's a different interface for each of them. Uh, and you can actually have both accounts if you would like them. I believe the main difference there is that the classic RefWorks does not integrate with Google Docs. The ProQuest one does. Uh, and RefWorks, so RefWorks organizes them for you, but it also generates the citations for you. Uh, what it's really handy for is not just generating individual citations, but generating an entire bibliography at once. Uh, so if you're, you know, doing a systematic review or an extensive literature review and have, you know, 20 or 30 citations that you're working with, rather than having to go through and individually generate them in our catalog or through some other means, you can import them all into RefWorks and just generate it all at once. And that's the other really great thing is that you can actually import uh, citations from our catalog, from PubMed, from Scopus. Uh, there's a number of different uh, databases and journals that you can import directly into RefWorks from, or there might be an extra step where you have to download a file and then upload it. But regardless, it's a much simpler process than trying to keep track of it all on your own. Uh, and if you go to this research guide that I link here after we're done, uh, you'll be able to find instructions for how to sign up, uh, be able to get yourself started there. All right, uh, and we have some library contact info. Um, so our hours are a little different this semester, as I said, given that we're all online at this point. Uh, we have a reference chat that is monitored from 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m., Monday through Thursday and then 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Friday. Uh, there is someone from reference in the library every day if anyone here is cleared to be on campus. Uh, so you can always stop by if that's the case and talk to someone in person. Uh, however, as I know, a lot of folks have not been cleared to be back on campus yet. Um, so if you're not cleared to be on campus, unfortunately, you can't come into the library. Uh, we also have the general library email you know, if you're working on something after business hours, I know a lot of folks here are doing, you know, working full time and then going to school in the evenings and that kind of thing. Uh, you're more than welcome to email us anytime 24 uh, seven. We'll get back to you sometime the next day if you're emailing us at, you know, one o'clock in the morning, um, but we will get back to you usually within 24 hours. Uh, and then if you have any specific citation questions, you're also welcome to shoot me an email. That's my personal email right there. Uh, happy to help with any specific questions you might have. Uh, yeah, and then last but not least, we do have a class survey that we ask folks to take and I'll send out this link along with the uh, full PowerPoint here at the end. Uh, we just ask that you give us a little bit of feedback. You know, we're constantly working on improving these webinars, uh, changing them up, making sure that they're as useful as they can be to everyone. Uh, so if you have any thoughts or suggestions, please drop us a line there.